So what happens next for a WNBA superstar today sentenced to nine years in a Russian prison? Nobody really knows for sure, even with pretty much everybody in the U.S. at least, hoping it involves a prisoner swap. We've got new reaction tonight from her team, Brittany Griners, and a White House that says she shouldn't even be there, plus the emotional moment in a Moscow court. And new charges tonight in the death of Breonna Taylor. Four officers now facing federal charges. What we're hearing from Taylor's mother, who says she's grateful to one attorney general and angry with another. Plus, monkeypox, now a public health emergency with this new declaration from the Biden administration that might unlock more money and speed up shots getting to people who need them. What, what, what one doctor is telling her patients about this disease, we're going to have a chat with an expert live. Plus, the biggest and brightest star tonight deep in the heart of Texas, the prime minister of Hungary. Why conservatives around the country are flocking to Dallas to see Viktor Orban. And new research shows how dozens of fake news sites and social media accounts tried pushing pro-China propaganda, but experts say some were kind of clumsy. We'll explain later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we're getting new reaction tonight from the White House to the sports world as Brittany Griner learns her sentence, nine years in a Russian prison, on what Moscow is calling drug smuggling, but the U.S. is dismissing as basically an oversight, right? Her hopes now centered on the possibility of a prisoner swap. And from what we're hearing today, it doesn't seem to be likely anytime soon. A U.S. official tells NBC News Russia has not responded to what they call the serious offer they lave, they've laid out for Griner and ex-Marine Paul Whelan in exchange for the arms dealer Victor Boot. President Biden is promising to do whatever he can to bring both Griner and Whelan home, with National Security Spokesperson John Kirby saying those Americans shouldn't even be there in the first place. She shouldn't have even been on trial. She's wrongfully detained. Uh, absent that, uh, we, we find the, the sentence reprehensible in its, in its scope. You see Griner here, behind bars, right, in that cage-looking thing. That's how she heard her sentence. She's 6'9", right? She has to sit down because she's just too tall for these cells that Russia holds detainees in. And right before the verdict, we heard from her. She says she made an honest mistake. I never meant to hurt anybody. I never meant to put in jeopardy the Russian population. I never meant to break any laws here. Listen, she is going through it overseas, but at home she's getting a lot of love with the WNBA and NBA saying they are committed to bringing her back. Her team, the Phoenix Mercury, saying we will not allow her to be forgotten. We are BG. And from some of her fellow stars in the league, free BG. Jewel Lloyd, just three broken hearts. That's what she tweeted. Skylar Diggins-Smith summing it up by calling the whole thing BS. Molly Hunter is following this from London. Okay, Molly, let's talk about the possibility then of this prisoner swap. Boots attorney, right, this notorious arms dealer who is presumed to be on the other end mm -hmm. of a potential swap, is saying he's hopeful. Well, yeah, like so is Brittany Griner, right, and Paul Whelan. But what is really going to happen next from here? Right. Neither of those lawyers actually get a say necessarily. Right. They are not involved in the negotiations. Our team, Hallie, actually literally just interviewed her lawyers. Um, I just got a transcript, and I was just going to share a little bit of the, what we're learning from them. They were asked, what are your thoughts about the possibility of a prisoner swap? And her lawyer, Brittany Griner's lawyer, said, we're not involved in these negotiations. But we do hope, of course, these talks will move forward after the verdict. So that's the big takeaway, right, is that, yes, they can be optimistic on both sides. Of course, Victor Boot's attorney wants to send Victor Boot home. Look, Victor Boot is incredibly valuable to Putin. This is a serious, notorious arms dealer. He is serving 25 years in the U.S. But even as the White House, you know, talks about the possibility of this prisoner swap, they're waiting for Russia, Holly. They are waiting for a serious response from Russia. So last week, when this prisoner swap was made public, when the U.S. put their cards on the table and said, hey, this is what we're going to offer up, there was a back-channel response that the U.S. didn't deem as serious. So basically what happened, we know this from our colleagues at the White House, is that Russia back-channeled a response and added another name to the list. They added a name named Vadim Krasikov, Halley. This is a Russian national. He is a convicted murderer. He is in German custody. He's not even in U.S. custody. This is not someone the U.S. can necessarily deliver or add to some prisoner swap. So is this going to happen? Are negotiations going to start? Uh, we don't know. And we also don't know who necessarily is going to be talking to who. We don't know if this is going to happen kind of in the public eye or if this is going to start happening behind closed doors. To be clear, Molly, like for Griner to go through the typical quote unquote court process in Russia, like there is basically no chance that she could appeal and that would be successful. Right. Like that's just not going to happen. 
No, and it's as, it's exactly like we expected her verdict to be right. guilty today. We expected her to be sentenced. Uh, I think when you ask her lawyers and you listen to her lawyers speak today, and again, our team just interviewed her lawyers in the last hour, they were surprised by how serious and hefty that sentence is. They did ask uh, about the appeals, and I'm just going to read again. I just got this transcript, Hallie. They asked, what is your plan? When are you going to appeal? And the judge, Hallie, uh, a reminder for our audience, said you have 10 days to appeal, so you have to appeal in the next 10 days. Her lawyer says, look, the trial is the first instance. This is the first thing that's over. There was a loss here today, but we will definitely file the appeal. We'll have 10 days for this. Next step will be the appeal and the hearing in the Court of Appeals. This will take a few weeks. We've got no timeline on this, but the idea that this appeal would overturn this verdict, uh, no one thinks that's a possibility, Hallie. Molly Hunter, thank you for that reporting. We're going to stay on top of that story, but we have other news to get to tonight, including the Justice Department in Washington announcing new federal charges against two current and two former Louisville police officers for allegedly violating the civil rights of Breonna Taylor. Remember, Taylor was just 26 when she was shot and killed at her home, her death, part of what sparked a sweeping national reckoning over race and justice. In March 2020, officers fired 22 shots into her apartment during a late night raid. One hit her in the chest. Nobody ever, right, nobody has ever faced direct charges for killing her. But now the Justice Department says the warrant for the raid was built on a lie, and that is why she's dead. Three of the officers you see here on your screen are accused of falsifying an affidavit. The fourth, Brett Hankison, is accused of using excessive force while executing that warrant. With Attorney General Merrick Garland making clear, if that had not happened, Breonna Taylor would be alive right now. This act violated federal civil rights laws and that those violations resulted in Ms. Taylor's death. Today in Louisville, Taylor's family and lawyers are saying they're grateful to the Justice Department. But here's her mom, Tamika Palmer, with more on just how tough this moment is. What well, we've been seeing on day one, y'all learning what we've been seeing was the truth that Absolutely. they shouldn't have been there and that Brianna didn't deserve that. Today's overdue. But it still hurts. I want to bring in NBC's Ron Allen, who is covering this for us. Ron, I want to talk about the family in a second. But first, let's start with these charges, because they are specifically about the violation of civil rights. Yes? Exactly. And remember, the state attorney general there chose not to file charges against the officers. He, he essentially said that the officers were justified in firing because Taylor's boyfriend shot at them first. However, the federal government saw it completely differently. They're saying essentially that that the officers lied to get this search warrant, that they shouldn't have even been there in the first place, and that Breonna Taylor essentially had the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to not be uh, uh, the subject of excessive force and unreasonable search and seizure by the police. Uh, and there is a lot of evidence, apparently, uh, indicating the length to which the police went to to construct this lie. Remember, the, the, the case was it was a drug case. The officers were investigating a, a boyfriend, a former boyfriend of Taylor's, and the, the officers told the judge that he was receiving packages at her place. Um, all that turned out to be not true. Um, but again, they executed this raid, uh, a warrant where they stormed in at, at late at night at 12.40 in the morning or so. Uh, Taylor's boyfriend, who was there, they were both asleep, opened fire, not sure what was going on. He claimed that they, felt, they thought it was an intruder, because they say that the police didn't identify themselves. The police say they did, um, but that's neither here nor there at this point. The bottom line is that it's been two and a half years, 874 days, the family has said, since this happened. And these charges really came out of the blue. There was no uh, no expectation. The, the Justice Department said they were investigating, they were investigating. But it's, it's somewhat unusual for the federal government to intervene or to take over or to file charges in a case that the state has essentially passed on. This happens from time to time. But it was a big surprise. The family is feeling some measure of relief. They, they still want everyone who was involved in this the police officers to be prosecuted. The officers who fired the fatal shots are not amongst the four who are being indicted, so there's still that. Um, you pointed out that there are two current and two former officers. Right. The two current officers, uh, the police chief, immediately began the process of trying to fire them, uh, so there are still more repercussions coming. And beyond all that, 
the Justice Department has a very wide-ranging pattern and practice investigation of every aspect of the Louisville Police Department still ongoing, looking at issues like their use of excessive force and whether or not there's discrimination in the department. Ron, you've covered this for years, right? And, I, and we saw those signs that were being held up, justice for Brianna. That became kind of a rallying cry. And I wonder how the family sees this moment, right? Because you heard Brianna Taylor's mom say, this is so overdue. Right? The people are just finding out now what they have always known, what they have always believed. The point is that what has sparked so much outrage about this case is that this woman was asleep in her home, in her bed, at 12.30 in the morning, and she ended up dead. And no one was held responsible for that. Right. The only officer who was prosecuted at, at a state level, Hankinson, was charged with recklessly firing into uh, an adjacent apartment and endangering right. her neighbors, not her. So there's accountability here, or at least the attempt of it, because, again, this is not a, a slam-dunk case that's going to necessarily end in a conviction. But uh, the family, their attorneys, their advocates are feeling some measure of relief. And remember, this case, as much as any, George Floyd, Omar Arbery, back in the spring of 2020, these were the three cases that really ignited the national reckoning that's been going on about that's race right. and about police violence and police abuse allegations. Um, there was just so much outrage about that. And again, it's taken two and a half years to get to this point, 874 days, we are told. Um, but here we are, the family feeling some measure of relief, and they hope that this is, again, a beginning or a continuation. They, they still want, again, every officer that was involved in this raid, and there were more than a dozen of them or so, uh, held accountable. Whether that'll happen or not, yeah. it's unclear. But the Attorney General, Merrick Garland, has really stepped into this. Remember, the Trump administration didn't touch this, uh, so it's taken a new, a new administration in Washington to see this differently and pursue the case. Ron Allen, uh, glad you're on top of the story for us. Thank you very much for bringing us the latest breaking news tonight. Appreciate it. As of tonight, there is a new official public health emergency in this country. With the Biden administration today taking the fight against monkeypox to a new level. Listen to how the health secretary is delivering a warning about this. Watch. We urge every American to take monkeypox seriously and to take responsibility to help us tackle this virus. All of it comes as officials acknowledge they're now playing catch up with this outbreak growing faster than expected. More than 6,000 monkeypox infections around the country. Dr. Natalie Azar is here to talk about what this all means, this public health emergency declaration in the fight against the outbreak. But let me start with Kelly O'Donnell at the White House. And what's interesting here, Kel, is the timing, right? Because we covered on this show how the WHO, the World Health Organization, called monkeypox a public health emergency like a month ago, I mean, last month. There has been pressure, it seems, on the Biden administration to do just this. Why now? Well, there has been pressure. And I remember we were asking President Biden about it when he was overseas in early okay. June. Uh, and so it has been building. And certainly what you've seen are cities like New York and San Francisco, where they have seen an increasing level of incidence of monkeypox and calling out, asking for additional help when it comes to vaccines and testing and really looking for federal help when resources have been uh, unavailable and when there have been questions and confusion. This is a virus that has not caused death in the United States, but certainly has caused a lot of, of difficult symptoms and confusion. It can create skin lesions and fever and body aches. And people have questions about how does it spread and who is at risk. And this national emergency will unlock some federal resources to have better coordination to try to make more vaccines available and to bring additional federal resources to bear. And we saw with uh, coronavirus and COVID over the last couple of years how that can unleash some of the additional resources and just get things moving and make local and state uh, offices of public health more available to to get what they need and to help local communities that are dealing with this. So there's been pressure on the Biden administration. They have named uh, a national coordinator and the White House says uh, that person will be able to uh, speak to some of these issues in the briefing room soon. But there are also still some questions, which gives you a sense that this is still a bit hurried. They have not formalized all of the elements of this national emergency and how yeah. uh, different medical uh, providers will be able to tap into it. Uh, that, there's still some work to do on this. Hallie? Based on the reporting that you and the team at the White House have done, Kelly, how, for lack of a better word, how angsty was it for officials to actually get here, right? Because we know from the reporting that's out there that we've done at NBC News that officials acknowledge they're scrambling to play catch up here. 
Angsty, uh, that seems to apply here. Uh, there has been pressure. There has been a sense of wanting to uh, convey that they have been on top of it, but there have been others who have been saying, no, it has been lagging, and that some of the lessons of COVID have not been fully learned, and concern about uh, not wanting to uh, cause unnecessary panic, and also uh, that it is not uh, as, uh, the prevalence is not as great as uh, what we had seen. It, it's just not the same as COVID. However, we've seen how this, this uh, virus has multiplied, doubling in cases in, in about a week. And so that they are taking seriously and say that uh, they need Americans' help to try to contain it. Can they contain it at this late point? Perhaps not, but they're hoping that a national emergency will be one more tool to slow the spread. Kelly O'Donnell, thank you very much. So Kelly has the political hat on. Let me bring in somebody who's got a doctor hat on, quite literally, sitting in her office, Dr. Azar. I know you just finished seeing patients, so thank you for being with us here, because we wanted to talk to you a little bit about how, how this actually does level up the monkeypox response and why this is so important. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I think there's... Uh multiple layers to this, Hallie. One is going to be just about communicating, right? I mean, those folks out there who work with the higher risk population, these, you know, sexual health providers, they need to be able to disseminate information that is accurate, um, you know, to individuals who are potentially vulnerable in their communities. That's just one small piece of it. The other thing is communicating to providers so that we know exactly what symptoms to actually look for. I mean, the only thing I would say that, that, that we could say as a little bit of a, well, we didn't really know because the rest of this approach or, or our actions have been really, truly myopic. I mean, I think we can all agree with that, is that originally we thought that this monkeypox was going to present with swollen lymph nodes and rashes all around, you know, every part of the body. And what we very quickly found out was that the presentation can be much subtler. You know, I think that this public health de declaration, as Kelly pointed out, is imperative in terms of being able to expand our ability to expedite data sharing, give technical assistance to state and local health departments. And, and really, I have to reemphasize that, you know, sort of the sexual health training and really targeting the communities at risk is going to be so, so important here, Hallie. Dr. Natalie Azar, so glad to see you. Thank you for your expertise here on the show tonight, as always. Appreciate it. Enjoy your commute home. It has been a brutal, extremely hot week. Do I even have to tell you this? Do you have a pulse? Do you have skin? Like, you know it is hot. And it's not just like, oh, duh, it's August. It's hot. Like, this is record-breaking hot. It is stretching infrastructure to the limit from power grids to roads that are literally buckling, bridges that are literally warping and bending because it is so hot. And we're talking about the heat being a big deal because of places like Texas, where most of the state is having a top three hottest summer ever. Look at Dallas. It gets hot there. They get like 2,200 degree days every year on average. It's already had 39, right? Almost twice as many. It's not going anywhere. Our Bill Karens is, is the bearer of bad news with more on this relentless stretch of, of 100 degree heat we expect. But I want to start with George Solis in Kentucky because, George, the heat index there, just like here in D.C., is hitting something like 100 degrees today. On top of, by the way, the recovery for flooding that people are going through, give us a sense of what you're seeing and what you're hearing, not just in Kentucky, but around uh, the region. Yeah, Hallie, make no mistake, it is very hot. Just standing out here for a few seconds and you start to glisten. I'm not sure if that's coming across through the screen right now, but I do want to start with a little bit of positive news in as many days here in the Kentucky region. The governor announcing today that the death toll is still 37, a tragic 37, including four children who were lost in that devastating flooding. Kentucky State Police say they are currently looking for two missing people. And that's incredible when you consider the amount of devastation that we've seen here on the ground over the last several days. Of course, search and rescue efforts will continue throughout the coming days, if not months. Power outages, another remarkable feat. When we first got here, they were out in the tens of thousands. They are now just down to a few thousand outages in different pockets in the affected regions. But the heat... The heat around the region is really what is slowing things down. You know, these groups are out here working around the clock. They don't want to stop, but unfortunately, the elements are forcing them to. They have to take breaks, otherwise they won't be able to continue with search and rescue efforts. It'd be too hard. Of course, water is also a necessity. Governor saying that he will keep bringing in truckloads of it as long as it is needed. And 
based on what we've seen, it's going to be needed for some time. There is some good news, though. There are about 11 cooling centers in the region right now, and that's going to help, especially for those people who don't have a home, who don't have AC to work through. And the one thing that we do want to keep touching on here is the resiliency of the people of Kentucky. They have endured so much. They've endured the threat of more rain and now this heat, but yet they continue working, trying to salvage what they have left in their homes, if they have any homes at all. Even those people that don't have anything are still going back out into these communities, working to help their neighbors to try to find some comfort in one another through this difficult time. And I do want to mention that a disaster relief fund for the people of Kentucky here has already exceeded more than $3 million, and that number surely expected to grow. Allie? George Solis, thank you so much. Bill Karens, to you now, because... You know, like just to, I walked to work today and I was like, oh, it's it's a furnace. Like it is a straight up, it is a straight yes. up furnace, you know, and, and it's not, it's going to be like that. It's just going to be like that for a while. That, that's it. I mean, yes, you just have to you have to accept it. And that's just kind of the way it is. And if you're lucky, you get rained on. And there is has been some lucky folks that were about 100 earlier that are now down in the 80s. And of course, it'll be super humid. But I think everyone will take whatever cooling they can get. So we just do this every single night, these numbers. 76 million now. So it's the middle of the country where it's a, a very much a dry heat and the drought just goes on and on and on. And then on the East Coast, it's really one of the hottest days we've seen in a long time for the mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. Now, as I said, a few spots have cooled off a little bit. The Great Lakes, Mid uh, Midwest, Ohio Valley, you're a little bit cooler. St. Louis, Indianapolis, enjoy it while it lasts. Dallas, you're 100 once again. San Antonio, check the box, 101. But where it was exceptionally hot today was anywhere from D.C. northward. Baltimore was 98 degrees at one point. Say, look at Philly, still at 97. Albany, New York hit 99 degrees, hottest in 11 years, but now thunderstorms have cooled them off. That's why Albany is currently 81. And the feels like temperature, if you're heading in the shade, remember, it still feels like 102 to 105 from D.C. all the way to Philly and even outside of New York. New York City got a little bit of a sea breeze. That's why it's a little cooler. But everybody else, it's still very hot. And the heat wave just goes on and on. As Hallie was mentioning, it's not like it's going to get cooler. I mean, it's going to be in the low 90s instead of upper 90s in the mid-Atlantic, in the Midwest is still going to be in the hundreds and the only thing that's going to cool people off will be a little bit of rain and uh, you're mentioning like you know on the bearer of bad news you know the climate scientists have a saying Hallie. they say i hope you're enjoying your hot summer this is the coolest summer for the rest of your life uh, and on that horrifically depressing note bill carrots i guess thank you do <laughs> i say is. thank you after it's a that horrible i don't saying. know because I got to tell you, I know what August in D.C. is like. I mean, this is and, and again, I, I sort of just to be transparent here, like one of my least favorite things is when the news is like, hey, guess what? It's hot. Like, yeah, it's summer. It's supposed to be hot. But this is, as you point out, like this is not a normal heat. Yeah. No, okay. no it's been way too warm for so many areas. I know. Well, Karen, appreciate you. Thank you. Some of the biggest conservative names on the planet are somewhere else that's hot tonight, Texas, for the CPAC conference. And the star of the stage at today's kickoff an authoritarian national leader under fire for saying racist stuff overseas. We're talking about Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who just recently in Romania said he doesn't want Hungary to become a mixed race, his words, a mixed race country, prompting one of his longtime advisors to quit, describing his speech as a Nazi diatribe. Here's how Orban defended himself today. In Hungary, we introduced a zero tolerance policy on racism and anti Semitism. So accusing us is fake news, and those who make these claims are simply idiots. And you might wonder okay, so why is this guy at CPAC, right? Start with who he actually is. He rose through Hungarian politics, running on anti immigration campaigns, his party, compared to an open dictatorship. He's changed laws in a controversial way anti immigration anti-gay, same-sex couples, for example, can't adopt children anymore. He's made it harder to be a journalist or part of an opposition group. So why CPAC, right? It's partly about who he's close with. His allies include this guy, former President Donald Trump, along with former White House strategist Steve Bannon, who called Orban the Trump before Trump. Orban supported Trump's, Mr. Trump's campaign in 2016, and the two met in Bedminster, that's this picture, just this week. And CPAC's organizers are defending their invitation to the Hungarian prime minister, a spokesperson saying, we support the open exchange of ideas, unlike so many American socialists. The press, 
they add, might despise Prime Minister Orban, but he is a popular leader. I want to bring in Gary Grumbach now. Gary, bring us up to speed on how things at CPAC went today and what happened. Yeah, I mean, those speeches, if you were to compare the two, read a transcript, all that was missing was pretty much the YMCA at the end. That was in terms of the similarities between a transcript of, of, of this speech right here and a former President Donald Trump rally that we've seen all across the country. And they were so similar because of what was talked about and the issues that were discussed, including Judeo-Christian traditions, the anti-migration ideas that he has, and also the promotion of uh, political correctness and the anti-political correctness, especially as it relates to pronouns. He also went on an anti-fake news rant, of course, which is something we've heard from President Trump quite a bit. But Orban, I should note, Freedom House is an organization that kind of tracks these kind of things. Orban's country of Hungary has been demoted to partially free because of what Orban has done in his country. And that comment from CPAC that you mentioned about him being a popular leader, he sure was popular in this room. People here were eating him up. They were laughing at his jokes. They were stand, giving him a standing ovation. They were very much agreeing with what he had to say. Allie? Uh, Gary, I think that's an important note at CPAC, but also talk about the names that are not here, right, and what's at stake. Because since the last time CPAC gathered in February, we've had the January 6th hearings. We saw primaries have started. We saw that vote in Kansas just this, just this week, the surprise vote protecting abortion access there. Um, but yet, you know, there are some big names that have been speculated about for 2024 who are not slated to speak. Yeah, we, we've seen, of course, the people that we are seeing to speak, which are the Trump wing of this party, right? We're not seeing the more conservative names, seeing people like Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, Chris Christie, Rick Santorum, uh, Governor Ron DeSantis. We're not seeing those names. Who we are seeing is the uh, Sean Hannity was just on stage. We're seeing tomorrow uh, Senator uh, Ted, uh, Ted Cruz, Rick Scott, uh, so the more Trump side of the world. And, uh, of course, this could be for a lot of reasons. I'm not sure it was a scheduling issue uh, for most people that couldn't make it. They were purposely not here because they don't want to stoke the flames of 2024. They don't want to say they're running when they're not yet running. And, of course, President Trump is speaking here on Saturday afternoon, and that's an important part of this, too. They don't want to necessarily become his topic of conversation either. Allie? Gary, what has stood out to you the most as somebody who covers politics, who's been on the road in an, you know, behind the scenes and in front of the camera capacity for a long time there, uh, there at CPAC this year. I think what really stuck out to me was how CPAC has changed. This used to be the place where conservatives could gather and be themselves. This has really turned into Trumpism and Trump world. And everybody here is 100 percent behind Donald Trump, whether or not he runs. And I think that was really fascinating. And also fascinating was this Viktor Orban speech and how the folks here with uh, supporting Viktor Orban and laughing at Viktor Orban and, and, and celebrating Viktor Orban's presence at an American CPAC rally uh, was passing. Here's one person we talked to today. So you are all in on all, President all Trump. All in. We need that bull on China shop. I'm at CPAC. Does that not tell you something? Uh, Trump all the way. Now, there are other sessions that are happening besides what's happening on this main stage, including one that's coming up real soon called Giving Liz the Biz, which is going to be with Jim Jordan, Representative Jim Jordan, and former Attorney General Matt Whitaker. Uh, that's going to be a very interesting conversation because they're going to talk about the illegitimacy or what they consider the illegitimacy of the January 6th committee and where that goes from here, especially as we get towards the midterms. Allie. Uh, Gary Grumbach, live for us there in Dallas. Gary, thank you. We have some breaking news to bring to you tonight on a story that we have been covering now for days, and that is the defamation trial against conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. That jury has reached a verdict. They deliberated for just about a day here. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about it. Remember, Alex Jones was on trial because these parents of one of the victims of that Sandy Hook massacre sued. For defamation, after Jones spread lies that the massacre was a hoax, that obviously is not true. These parents were seeking $150 million. The verdict is in. Jones is going to have to pay at least $4 million. I want to get right to NBC's Ben Collins, who is following this. So I want to be clear here. From my understanding, um, Ben, and I think you are with us now. I haven't actually seen your face pop up, but I'm going to trust fall. There you are. Into, into, the, into the newscast here. Um, this is the first, there, there's more to come tomorrow, but so far, and just so people understand, these plaintiffs, these parents, 
had been seeking damages because they've been living a nightmare, right, for the better part of a decade, because Jones has been lying about how their son was killed. They wanted $150 million. Jones's people said, we'll pay $8. The, the, the end result is so far $4 million. Yes, so far $4 million. So this is a bifurcated trial. This is the compensatory stage, usually a little less. Explain than the that. Next stage. What is bi bifurcated and measure? Just put it in super plain English here, Ben. There's two parts of this yeah, trial, sure. right? And this is just one of them. Yeah, uh, punitive is, uh, you know, the malice part of this thing. That's That, that usually is where uh, the larger figure comes. So this is lower than I, I think. Uh, they anticipated, um, at least the, the Sandu parents anticipated, $4.1 million. We'll see what happens with this uh, with this next round here. Alex Jones said more than $2 million would sink InfoWars. That is almost certainly not true. Uh, you know, he just got a $7 million anonymous Bitcoin donation a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, $4 million right away, right now. We're going to hear some more tomorrow. This, this specific jury is going to reconvene tomorrow. Hear from some more witnesses, and uh, they're going to go through the next charge against Alex Jones. Um, help me understand some of this, because the jury basically gets this blank piece of paper, and they write in dollar amounts based on these charges, yeah. right? Because, again, the question in front of the jury is not whether Alex Jones lied about Sandy Hook. He did. Like, that's... He lied. Like, that's been decided. The question is, yep. what is the punishment for doing that and defaming these parents and, and the, what they have had to go through? So the jury goes through, like, a blank sheet of paper, and they write down dollar figures. Was the expectation, Ben, that this first chunk of results would be the sort of more serious stuff, if you will? It, it's more of, uh, you know, there are more blanks to fill in this time, but the, the dollar figures were assumed to be lower. Uh, maybe not this low, but they were assumed to be lower. Uh, in, in, in one of the cases, one of the blanks they had to fill in was $0. Uh, there were about eight, eight of them to, uh, to figure out. We're going to go through the paperwork in a minute. But uh, some of these were for $50,000, some of them for $1.5 million. Uh, if you add it all up, you get to $4.1 million. Uh -huh. And, you know, tomorrow they're going to uh, chat again. They said that Alex will not himself once again testify tomorrow. Um, but uh, this case will go on against Alex Jones. Do, have you heard anything from his attorneys in court related to this verdict yet or outside of court? Do we know any reaction? And again, I know this just broke. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I am. They, they are. This is as fresh as it gets. We, this, this happened about four or five minutes ago. So um, uh, not yet. They are, I, if they are out of the courtroom yet, I'd be surprised. Uh, so uh, we're going to go back and we're going to go figure that out in a couple of minutes. I'm going to give you a second to look at your phone, but please stand by because I want to keep you here. I also want to bring in former prosecutor David Henderson just for your reaction, David. Then I'll go back to Ben for some other developments. Um, is this roughly what you expected in an extremely, I think, high profile, closely watched trial? The first that Jones himself faces on defamation. I have to be honest with you. I think this number is low, but it's very difficult to put that in context because this has been such a crazy trial. And something you have to remember is that to everyday working people, 4.1 sounds like a really high number. It's just that in the context of what these parents went through, overall, I think these damages are low. It's lower than what I expected. Talk about what it is that these parents went through. Um, the, the, their son was one of the victims of this horrific shooting that we all know about at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, that took the lives of two dozen people. Um, since then, since Jones, in his conspiracy theory musings, has, has said this is a hoax, he acknowledged on the stand it was not. He now knows it was not. Um, these people have been living a nightmare. Absolutely. They have. I'm not only a former prosecutor, I'm a former special crimes prosecutor. So unfortunately, I've tried lots of cases where terrible things have happened to children, including death. And I'll put it to you this way. Every child knows you're going to have to bury your parents one day. No parent expects to have to bury their children. And so when a parent has to do that under circumstances like these, where they're accused of lying about the basis of their grief, it's impossible to put a dollar figure on that. I think part of what may have been the problem here is that knowing that Jones was already essentially guilty for the offense, they may have overlooked that in terms of their presentation to the evidence and given the jury a full picture of everything these parents have been through. Neil Heslin, the father yes. of Jesse Lewis, um, had been had testified to about the horror of all of this. I want to see if we still have Ben Collins, David, if you could stand by, because there was this sort of jaw dropping moment that Jones himself called this Perry Mason moment that we've seen developments on related to the entire contents of Alex Jones's phone that were accidentally leaked from Alex Jones's attorneys to 
the opposition team, right, to the prosecutors, to the plaintiffs, not the plaintiffs attorneys here. Um, now, the January 6th Select Committee is asking the Sandy Hook parents lawyer for those messages. Why? Uh, because Alex Jones pled the fifth about 50 times when he actually talked to the January 6th committee. Um, there is, so Owen Schroyer, who's his like underling, his right-hand man, he handed over his phone, or at least parts of it, but it, not the full complete phone. This is all of Alex Jones's phone, including things that he really did not want public. For example, the financials of InfoWars. And also uh, psychiatric records, uh, unbelievably, of some Sandy Hook parents in a future trial, future defamation trial that is coming. Uh, it is unclear how he ever got those or why they were being sent uh, to these lawyers or you know why he knew about them at all. Um, and that's in part why you're probably not going to see just a giant tranche of these things just out there on the right. street somewhere. Uh, it's because there's probably some very there's some stuff in there that should remain uh, confidential to victims. Uh, in this situation. So this is just the beginning for Alex Jones's troubles. And he's going to campaign on this. And, you know, he will make back $4 million pretty easily saying that he was banned and that the justice system is out to get him. That's his, That's been his whole shtick be even before, uh, you know, he was in any legal trouble. So um, $4 million is a, a pittance at the moment. We'll see what happens at the second half of this trial. There, there is the, the point, and I want to bring in Rahima Ellis, our NBC News correspondent, who has also been covering this trial and this story. Um, there is also, Rahima, the fact of the matter that Alex Jones faces other trials now. And I wonder how this verdict plays into those. Uh, I think that's the question a lot of people are asking, because the fact that there was he was found liable in terms of de the defamation charges that had been right. placed against him, that had an impact, it seems, on the other cases. Now, what impact will this jury award have on those other cases once they come to uh, the courtroom? As was mentioned, the uh, parents in this particular case were asking for $150 million in damages as a result of what they say was the anguish and the torment that they faced as a result of the hoax that Alex Jones had been propagating. Today, the jury in Three out of eight questions that they were asked to consider, they came back with an announcement about three of them. They came back with an award of $4,110,000. As was mentioned, uh, this is a small amount of money when it comes to looking at the broad vast of funds that Alex Jones allegedly had amassed in his career and in propagating this false information about what happened at Sandy Hook. So. It's a great question, Hallie, as to what happens going forward. And it's also important to mention, as was just mentioned, that this is just the beginning. Uh, right. This trial isn't even over yet. This is the first right. phase. And even after they answer the questions that have been presented to them in this phase, they have another phase within this whole uh, uh, case that this jury will be, could be asked to consider, which may, depending on how they feel about things, could award the parents of little six-year-old Jesse even more in terms of what the final outcome is in this particular phase of trials against Alex Jones. Yeah, Scarlett Lewis and Neil Hessler, the parents there. David Henderson, let me, Rahima, thank you. David Henderson, let me go back to you quickly here so you can put your legal hat on and help us try to connect the dots of how, A, this verdict could affect those other trials, and B, you know, Jones notably on the stand acknowledged, he says, that he now knows he was 100 percent wrong about Sandy Hook when he called it a hoax. That was a lie. That wasn't true. It obviously happened, and it was horrific. Um, do, do you think that made a difference here? I think it made a difference. But when you ask me if it made a difference in terms of the number, which we refer to as damages, that's a much harder question to answer. And to put this in perspective, people write books on how to ask juries for money. I thought the way mm. that it was approached here in this trial was really bold, asking for $150 million up front has the potential of forcing the jury to just tune you out, because it's really hard to process a number that big, especially if you don't put it in context. Now, I think the bigger question with the way that Jones behaved is, ultimately, whether or not all of his ridiculous behavior actually benefited him. And this number is so low, I think it did. And the reason why is because the jury didn't understand what $4 million means to him. I think to them, it seemed like a big number. But as a penalty for him, it really isn't. 
Ben, let me go to you because we have to note, too, that throughout all of this, throughout even, I think Ben is still with us, even throughout this trial, Alex Jones was going on InfoWars railing against it. The judge had to scold him and say, stop lying. She said, I think it's, and, um, she said it's absurd that she had to remind him to stop lying under oath. Jones also understands how to, and has made a career of, you know, making moments out of serious moments like this, right? I, I just, I'm, I'm wondering how we are expected to see this $4.1 million, you know, verdict, these damages against him so far. Does that, will he be repentant? Oh, Allie. Well, Alex like, Jones I know the answer is no, but do you see what I'm getting at, Ben? Do you see what I'm getting at? Like, like tomorrow, yeah, to, like, tomorrow yeah, Alex no, Jones is going to come out yeah. and make a big thing about this. You know what I mean? I, I wonder. I, I, I don't know that, right? Like, I don't have reporting on that, but it feels of a piece with what he has shown in the past. Yeah, he's already been doing this today. You know, he's he's been fundraising off this all day long. While, you know, while the jury was in deliberations, he was on InfoWars uh, talking about how badly you need to buy his high-grade uh, prepper products because, remember, the world is ending and all this stuff is happening. Uh, this is a fundraising uh, campaign for him now. From now on, you know he's going to say that he was kind of taken down by the government, and he's being, you know, uh, he, like there is a cabal out to get him. Uh, it, all the stuff that he has said all the time, but now he gets this. The persecution complex. He has a dollar figure attached to it. He can say, you know, I need to make that that four million dollars back up. I need you guys to buy. Uh, these pills that help your brain out and stuff. That's what he does. That's what he's been doing all day long. He will not be repentant on this. This is, I mean, I've been covering Alex Jones for a decade. I can tell you right now, there is no way. Um, we'll see what happens with the punitive damages here. It's a different ball game over there. Well, you know, punitive means to punish. Someone needs to, we'll see if he is going to get punished for this uh, more than I would say a, a couple of weeks worth of revenue. But as it stands, that is not what happened. $4 million is but a couple of weeks worth of revenue. To be clear, this number could potentially go way up after court resumes tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, 8.45 a.m. Eastern. It could go way up. And also, uh, this is not the end of it. There's two more defamation cases after this, one Sorry. of which he, these, new, uh, these new emails and texts uh, have already affected. So, uh, yeah, this, this is not the end of the, uh, the paying up phase for Alex Jones. So we'll be talking about it again tomorrow night here on the show. Ben Collins, David Henderson, former prosecutor. My thanks to Rahima Ellis as well, our team of reporters and analysts, bringing you all the news as it develops live right here on NBC News Now. We have more, too, because when we come back, you know it's getting tense on Capitol Hill as Democrats wait to see what one key Democratic senator could do. As we now learn timing of when exactly this vote on a bill Democrats want to get passed on climate and health care and taxes could happen. Stay with us. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announcing late today the Senate's going to start the process of voting on that big spending package on Saturday afternoon. Let me just say that. Start the process of voting because it's a process. This thing might go on until Monday, right? It's a bill the Democrats really want to get done on climate and energy and taxes and health care. But there is a catch. And her name is Senator Kirsten Sinema. Okay, because they don't know where she is on this. They're looking for a wink or a nod or anything from her, because I probably don't have to remind you this, but just in case, they cannot get it done themselves unless Senator Sinema is on board. Her team saying, well, she wants the OK from the parliamentarian. This is like a whole thing about, you know, how it gets paid for, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's weedsy nerd stuff, but that's important to members of Congress. OK, and that's what Senator Sinema wants to see. The bill has money in it for stuff like climate change and health care and tax increases on corporations. But cinema has a couple of issues with the tax piece. And you may think, oh, man, this is politics per usual. Like, Hallie, you D.C. correspondent. That's how this thing is. But, but remember, she is now the key vote on a piece of legislation her party hopes to run on in November to keep control of the House and potentially gain more control in the Senate. I want to bring in now Ali Vitale. OK, Ali. So one big question has been answered, and that is... Saturday, the wheels will be in motion. The other yeah. big question has not been answered, which is, will, will Kirsten Sinema be standing in front of those wheels or behind them? <laughs> yeah, so one DC correspondent to another, we don't know. <laughs> That's like the real answer here is we're trying to figure out where Sinema is. And there's a risk to this strategy a little bit, too, because Schumer at this point is saying that sometime after 1230 on Saturday, 
they are going to do what they call a motion to proceed, which is effectively the first thing they have to do in order to just kick off this process. And it would be an otherwise innocuous procedural step, but because it's the first time that cinema is going to be able to vote on something that gets them onto this bill, it's the first time that we'll actually see if she's voting to proceed onto it or if she wants to stop this in its tracks. And the reason that it's risky is because it's likely that she won't have the fully okayed by the parliamentarian text by then. They could have it, but based on the pace that we know that they're working at, it's also just as likely that they don't have it. And so it does sort of put cinema in a place where she said she wants to wait for the text to be okayed, but she may not have the okayed text by the time that they actually start this process. Explain to people why this is so important for Democrats, Ali, because it is part politics, but it's part policy, too, they say. It's both. They are at this point at a place politically where they've spent the last year trying to do something on what we're calling reconciliation, but what has been over the course of the last year something that included billions of dollars for the care economy, and then that got stripped out, and now it's just tax reform and uh, climate pieces and also deficit reduction. Like It's a big bunching together of all of these Democratic priorities that they would really like to run on in the midterms. And so politically, Democrats can't look like this is falling apart again because they've been at this finish line moment before then there's the other piece of this where republicans politically for a midterm issue really want to make this a referendum on the economy and certainly they don't have to try very hard because people are looking at their gas prices they're looking at inflation numbers and they're noticing that their their dollar is not stretching as far as it used to democrats would very much like to be able to campaign on a counter to that, saying, hey, we passed this thing called the Inflation Reduction Act. It's literally in the name of it. And they want to be able to go home and take that home to their voters. It's not their entire message for the midterms, but it is a really central piece of it. And so it would help inoculate them from some of those Republican attacks, while also showing that Democrats who have both houses of Congress in their control, as well as the White House, can actually govern and use that power. So it's definitely two-pronged. Ali Vitali, live for us on the Hill. Thank you, Ali. Um, enjoy your weekend uh, spending time in that building and getting takeout. Thanks. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, today you're seeing China launch military drills around Taiwan, firing ballistic missiles into the water around the island. Taiwan's a self-ruling democracy, and its defense ministry called China's moves irrational. But you know that Beijing claims the island as its own territory and announced these drills after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi got there this week. And that brings us to number two, because Speaker Pelosi is still in the region today, tweeting photos from her visit with some other lawmakers to the DMZ, as it's called, the demilitarized zone that separates South Korea from North Korea. She said they thanked U.S. service members on the ground there and said the U.S. and South Korea have, in her words, an unbreakable bond. Number three, jurors in the trial of the Parkland school shooting suspect visited the site of the massacre today. They toured rooms in a Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School building, rooms that are still stained with blood. The suspect waived his right to go with them. The building's been sealed ever since that attack in 2018, and local officials plan to demolish it when it's finished being used as evidence. The suspect has pleaded guilty and could face the death penalty. Number four, the Justice Department says, the former governor of Puerto Rico, Wanda Vasquez, has been arrested on bribery charges. She's the first former governor of the U.S. territory to face federal charges. She's previously denied any wrongdoing. Number five, looks like the Great Barrier Reef is bouncing back. A little good climate news for a change. A new report from the Australian Institute of Marine Science says parts of the reef are showing their highest coral cover in more than three decades. Now, listen, they're not out of the woods. The reef says, so to speak, the reef says that um, the report says the reef is still vulnerable to mass bleaching. Coming as UNESCO considers whether to still list the reef as in danger. Coming up. Police are looking for a semi-truck after someone allegedly saw a woman bloodied and yelling inside of it. We've got that next in the local. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Northeast Bureau, New Jersey police say they're looking for this white truck, the, the semi, you see it? After somebody allegedly saw a woman with blood on her screaming for help inside. It's obviously, you really can't see that in this surveillance video, but police say a customer at this car dealership saw a woman hop out of the passenger window. As this person got closer, 
They say this woman was pulled back inside. The truck took off. Investigators say the truck is white and has blue riding on the side. Obviously, we're going to try to bring you any updates on that as we get them. From our Southeast Bureau, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has suspended a top county prosecutor from Tampa, saying he was neglecting official duties after this prosecutor said he wouldn't go after people who get abortions, basically, and wouldn't enforce a potential law banning surgeries for transgender children. Warren called his, the prosecutor called his suspension a political stunt on DeSantis's part and said the governor was using his office to further his own political ambition. From our Midwest Bureau, Cincinnati Zoo is celebrating because there's a brand new baby in the bloat. Did you know they call a bloat like that's where hippos live? Well, that's where this little baby hippo is. We can, look at that little nugget. Look at that little beanie. We don't, we don't have a name. There's no name because the calf kind of surprised zoo staff. BB, the mom, was on birth control. The zoo says visitors are not actually going to be able to see the hippo for at least a couple of weeks as mom and baby bond. You know what? I love a good mom story. I'm like down with a good, cute baby story, human or hippo, okay? Coming up, we're going inside the darker side of the metaverse and why it's got parents and child advocates really concerned. Kate Snow joins us on that after the break. As the metaverse gets more and more popular, you've got some people questioning, okay, but how safe is it, especially for kids? Because after all, inside the metaverse, the avatars for players can interact with other avatars in these virtual worlds. And these worlds, for the most part, are new. The rules are still being defined. And unfortunately, there can be a darker side to the metaverse that some people have experienced firsthand. Kate Snow spoke with 12-year-old Jaden, a sixth grader out in Southern California who loves playing games in VR on Oculus. But a lot of the content has some child advocates concerned. Here's what Jaden's mom had to say. Does it concern you what he's hearing? I, in the beginning, it did, but I know I can't necessarily limit or eliminate him from playing these games. So I'd rather approach this issue through communication. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow is joining us now. Kate, I'm glad you're with us here. Talk about, and I know you do so much reporting on yeah. kids online and now in the virtual world and their safety. What are the mechanisms, right. mechanisms in place for these kids on the metaverse? Yeah, so let me walk you through. The, the biggest player in this space is the company Meta, which makes a headset called Quest, which is the most popular of all these headsets that will get you into the metaverse in that virtual reality world with your avatar along with other avatars. Meta gave us a statement. They talk about a bunch of things they do to try to keep young people safe. They talk about the devices are not intended for anyone under 13. Really, kids under 13 shouldn't be in this universe. They also say that parental controls exist in Meta so that if you're a parent of someone over 13, you can be using those controls to limit and monitor usage. They say you should do that like you do with any new technology. There are also ways, Hallie, to block people, report people if you have concerns about them, abusive behavior or content. And you can push a button when you're in there and immediately get out of the universe that you're in. You can kind of escape. All that said... That's meta. There are a lot of games and apps within the so-called metaverse that are not created by meta. Some of that content's made by other companies. And here's a bit more of what we saw when we watched Jaden play. Jaden's mom, Adriana, doesn't let him use his microphone to talk to other players. But Jaden hears a lot of offensive, sexually explicit, even racist language. You've heard the N-word? Mm-hmm. Like one time or lots of times? All the time. All the time. We heard it in a game called Gun Raiders, not created by Meta, but available in the Quest headset. Pop your head up. Back the it's the content, but also the impact from immersion that has child advocates concerned. The metaverse is the new wild, wild west for kids. Millions of kids across the country and around the world are using these headsets. They could be exposed to all sorts of hateful, content, violent content, sexual content, and you just see them with their little glasses on, you have no idea what they're doing. The company behind Gun Raiders told us, while not a typical player experience in Gun Raiders, we are aware that issues like this do happen in our game today. We are continually deploying new moderation yeah. features. 
So Common Sense Media and other people like them who are looking at all this, Hallie, they say this is evolving technology. Their concern is that the technology came first, and now we're scrambling to right. try to put in the safety controls. So then what is the news you can use if you're a parent and you're like, what do I need to do? What do I need to know to make sure my kids stay safe? Yeah. Well, you could study those parental monitoring tools that I mentioned. I mean, they exist. There are things you can do to try to put some parameters on your kids and even yourself, like trying to, you know, limit your exposure if you want to. We also get into adults in this piece that I'm doing for Nightly News, Hallie. We talk about a woman named Nina Jane Patel. I interviewed her. She's actually a researcher who studies the metaverse. And she herself, when she first went in with the goggles on, she experienced what she said was essentially sexual assault of her avatar wow. being surrounded by male avatars and attacked. Yeah, so this isn't just about kids. It's actually about all of us and how we're going to exist in this, this universe that seems to be here to stay. Kate Snow, we're so glad to have you on top of this story for us. Thank you. And as Kate mentioned, you can catch more of her reporting tonight on Nightly News, 630 Eastern with Lester Holt. That does it for us this hour. We'll have more for you here tomorrow, same time, same place. I'll see you a little bit later on in August. You'll be in good hands in the meantime. Love to have you here. Thank you. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.